Berkeley. Welcome back to the Bay Area. Let Thank you. Uh, where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in San Francisco, born in 1935. Um, lived there until 1948. Uh, when I was 13, the, my grandfather was mayor of the city, 1942-46, so I sometimes got to go out with the mayor in the launch to one of the Navy ships in the bay. Mm -hmm. And I can remember being piped aboard a carrier and saluting Admiral Halsey mm -hmm. at some point in, in the middle 40s. So from an early age, you were ready to command. I wasn't ready to command, <laughs> no. The, uh, and then, of course, grandfather was also mayor when the UN charter was written in, in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, excused from school uh, to attend some of the Mm -hmm. plenary sessions mm -hmm. in the in the opera house. And where were you educated? At, in San Francisco or did you go away to school? I went to a grammar school at, at, uh, called the Town School for Boys in, in Pacific Heights in San Francisco and then I moved east when I was 13 I went to a boarding school in Connecticut, the Hotchkiss School, then Yale and then for a year to Cambridge, Cambridge England. So, so how does a, a son of the establishment become uh, such a political maverick, or are you a political maverick? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I think of myself as having, I can remember the, uh, the beginning of the UN. I mm -hmm. can remember the, the liberal idea of Franklin Roosevelt, the four freedoms. I can remember um, when Harry Truman came to San Francisco and June of 1945, mm -hmm. I think it was the biggest crowd that had ever been turned out in the history of the state. Mm -hmm. And the, I, I had developed a rather old-fashioned idea of what, uh, of the government as a servant of the people rather than the people as a servant of the government. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I don't think of myself as, uh, as a radical. I, I'm, I'm think of myself <laughs> somebody who's trying to uh, remember uh, what this, the principles on which this country uh, was founded. Let's uh, stay with your career for a while. What, what, what led you to become a writer? We'll get back to this political stuff shortly. Well, I, I developed an early love for reading and for words. Mm -hmm. And um, I couldn't imagine anything more um, exciting to do than, than to try to put words on paper. And when I left uh, Cambridge University, I, I, I had thought I might become an historian, but I didn't have the patience mm -hmm. for scholarship. So I came back from England and went into the newspaper business in uh, San Francisco, and I thought that would be a way to learn to write. There, there was a tradition in the 30s of important American writers, people like Ernest Hemingway, starting as newspaper reporters. And I thought, OK, this is the way you learn to do it. And I, I, I can remember I was assigned by the San Francisco Examiner to the Oakland City Hall. My first four months on the paper were in the press room. The, the press room was in the city hall together with the courts and the mayor's office and the police, the police station. And I can remember my first assignment was to cover a flower show in <laughs> somewhere in the foothills of Oakland. And uh, I wrote 4,000 words on that. <laughs> um, I, I brought it into the... Uh, the uh, bureau chief in Oakland, a man named Crowley, wore a hat. And uh, he looked at it, he read it, and he said, these are the most beautiful 4,000 words I've ever read. <laughs> I almost wept, he said. <laughs> uh, then he said, but he said, do me a favor. He said, see if you can cut it in half. Mm -hmm. And so I did, and I brought it back. And then he said, he, we went through this again, he said, these words are so beautiful. It's hard for me to say this, but try and cut it in half again. And the, uh, 
we, we did that a couple of times. It, it came out as one paragraph <laughs> in the Sunday newspaper. <laughs> so, so was this, uh, did this encourage you to pursue that career further? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> it, it, it taught me a certain economy of, of, uh, <laughs> of language. I, I did want to mention that you also were interviewed for the CIA. Uh, is that I the, was interviewed for the, the CIA, CIA. And, and the, but that was another choice uh, that you decided against. What was that experience that, like? That, well, the, um, I went from Yale in the, I graduated from Yale in June of 56, mm -hmm. went to Cambridge University in the fall of 1956, and I had not been particularly engaged in foreign affairs as a student at Yale. I'd been reading uh, the works of Bertolt Brecht and Albert Camus and, and uh, obscure medieval poets and, and I had not been following the newspapers but suddenly the fall of 1956 is the year of the Hungarian uprising and a number of and it's also the year of the Suez Canal crisis and the a number of uh, young men that I knew in Cambridge had gone to Budapest to take to um, show support for the uprising and, and uh, two of them had actually been killed and so suddenly I was having to justify and explain American foreign policy to some very angry English undergraduates and I didn't know anything so I began to read newspapers and uh, books and when I came back from Cambridge having given up the idea of being a historian I stopped on the way to San Francisco in the newspaper business. I stopped in Washington and had an interview with the uh, with the, with the agency uh, because I'd been Yale was a recruiting outpost for the agency during the late 40s and the 50s, and a, a couple of my English professors had sort of mumbled over over drinks at Maury's that if I was ever at a loose end in uh, Washington to call this number, so I, I, <laughs> I, I, uh, <laughs> I called the number and the, I went and the, the CIA in those days it, it did not yet have its offices in Langley, Virginia, and it was in temporary headquarters, which were Quonset huts down near the Lincoln Memorial, and the examinations went on for about a week. There were physical examinations, and mental examinations, and psychological examinations. And I got through those, and finally I got to the interview. And the interview was with um, what the agency called some of the younger guys. And I was 22, I guess, 1957. And these guys must have been in their late 20s, early 30s. There were, there were about three of them, four of them. All Yale, and, and all uh, George Bush kind of Yale. I mean, from those that defense club, DKE. I mean, it was that that uh, um, preppy tone, and they were very uh, pleased with themselves. They, and it was like being interviewed for uh, the best fraternity in the world. <laughs> and, and the, uh, <laughs> I was going to get to play the big varsity game of the Cold War, right? And I had studied for this exam. I, I hadn't quite written things on the cuff of my shirt. I'm, you know, I, but I was prepared to tell you how many roads there were through the Arden Forest and where was the Fulda Gap and the Romanov dynasty and the tragedy of the Habsburgs and, and uh, Lenin's early life. I, I, was, I was up for that kind of question. And the first question was, uh, the first question was, um, you are standing on the 13th tee at the National Golf Club links in uh, Southampton. What club do you hit? <laughs> that question tells you, A, are you the, the right sort that would have mm -hmm. known where the National mm -hmm. Golf Links was, and B, you know, how good a golfer you were mm -hmm. because it was a short hole. And depending on whether you hit a four iron or a seven iron mm -hmm. would place you in the hierarchy of, of, of <laughs> golfers. I answered that question. I knew that question. The second question was... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> Second question was, it is late August, six o'clock in the evening, and you are on your final tack into the Hay Harbor Yacht Club on Fisher's Island. Mm -hmm. What tack are you on? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I also I knew that mm -hmm. one. Um, third question was, um, does Minxie uh, Haynes wear a slip? <laughs> Minxie was the, the great kind of uh, uh, nymphomaniac uh, figure of the, of the Ivy League circuit in the 50s and, and everything. She was a, a wild thing. As, as, as the expression had it, and um, I said, I said, gentlemen, I said, um, I can't answer that question. I have, you know, my information is secondhand rumors. Mm -hmm. I have a rumor of Belgian lace, but it's unconfirmed. <laughs> and the, um, <laughs> and I said, beside that, uh, clearly, I, I, I have made a mistake. I. I I apologize uh, for wasting your time. And the, um, I got up and, and walked out. And, and the, uh, I've never, never been surprised uh, at the uh, blunders of, of the CIA <laughs> since <laughs> since that day, because it, the um, these people were deeply self-absorbed, and, mm -hmm. and they were not, you know, they, they were not really. Um, going to learn much, so that uh, when they got it wrong about the end of the Cold War, and when they got it wrong about Vietnam, um, yeah, that didn't shock me. So let's go back to journalism now. Uh, you, you wound up at Harper's. You came to Harper's uh, at the, the time that, that Willie Morris was editor? <laughs> yeah, Willie Morris was, I came to Harper's, I'd been at the Saturday Evening Post in the 60s, and the Saturday Evening Post folded, I think, in 1968. And I had a contract to write eight pieces a year, and I traveled all over the, I spent most, six months of the year traveling. Um, California, Europe, uh, the Washington, Caribbean, wherever. And, that was a wonderful uh, job, and, but the magazine failed. Then I had the same job at Life, Life Folded. <laughs> and then I um, became a contributing writer to Harper's Magazine about 1970. And I can remember the first piece that I wrote was uh, about the oil uh, bonanza in Alaska. when the the Prudhoe Bay North Slope oil came in and all of the money went into the jurisdiction of the government. So I spent the three months of the first uh, legislature in Juneau to see how they would dispose of their sudden good fortune. And I wrote that article for Harper's Magazine and then I was working on a second article about Wall Street when Willie Morris got into a, a um, an argument with the then publisher of the magazine, a man named Coles. The magazine was then owned by the Minneapolis Star and Tribune Company. And I didn't know Willie very well. I mean, I, I met him a couple of times, mostly at a um, bar called the Lanes of, of Uptown New York, Second Avenue. And so I was not really privy to the argument. I didn't have any, I, I'd only been in the office twice to bring a manuscript, and the, so I didn't uh, see it the way he did. He, he and his friends, some of the other contributing writers, saw it as an argue, argument, art versus money, and I didn't see it that way, so that when he quit, and so did, or, or was fired, I mean, it depends who telling the story, and the, um, so did the other five or six people, and so on, um, on Monday, I was a contributing writer, and on Tuesday, I became the acting managing editor. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, it was a fluke, and it is 30 years later. <laughs> <laughs> but I 
stayed as the editor because it gave me a chance to write. And um, um, that was dear to me. Mm-hmm. So I learned to be learned to be an editor. So uh, you you fell into a position for really a a distinguished journal in in American history magazine rather. Yeah. T- tell us a little about that magazine and and you know what it stood for. Well, Harper's Magazine is the what we we like to say it's the oldest continuously published magazine in the country. It was established in 1850. The Scientific American was established in the 1830s, but then went out of business for mm-hmm. 30 years before it was revived. Harper's has never missed an issue since 1850. The, it was a, there was a company called Harper and Brothers. They were a publisher, book publisher, founded in 1819. By 1850, the biggest publisher in the world, bigger than any publisher in, in uh, Europe, in England, or in, in Scotland. Um, they started the magazine to um, take up downtime on their new presses and also to use the magazine as a way of promoting their books. They put serial uh, novels by Dickens and Trollope and also to attract writers. I mean, it, 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 Harper's Magazine published the first uh, piece uh, published by Mark Twain which came in as a letter from Hawaii. And, but the S looked like, the T's in those days could look like an S, so the first piece appears under the name Mark Swain. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, and the first editor was, was a, an extraordinary man, a man named Henry Raymond, who had been born in what was the outback country of western New York in 1820. Uh, and he, he came to New York in the 1840s, and he, he was the executive editor of Horace Greeley's Tribune. Greeley was a man who went around like to make speeches. He was a presence. Young Raymond was the man that actually wrote the paper in the 1840s. The Harper brothers hired him to be the first editor of Harper's Magazine. and. In 1851, Raymond founded uh, the New York Times, and he was the first editor of the New York Times at the same time that he was the editor of Harper's Magazine. And then in 1853, he was elected to the legislature in Albany and became speaker of the uh, lower house, still retaining the editorship of the Times and the editorship of the Harper's Magazine, Mm -hmm. and manuscripts would be sent up the river to him by steamboat. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually he gave up the magazine, kept the paper. Then he gave up the, uh, uh, the political career to become the speechwriter and uh, champion for uh, John Charles Fremont, the senator from California, the great pathfinder, who was the first Republican candidate for the presidency in 1856. And so Raymond writes the founding documents of Mm. what we now know as the Republican Party for a convention in Pittsburgh in in 1850s. And, uh, but he's still the editor of the Times. And then he becomes, uh, Fremont loses, and uh, Raymond becomes friends with Lincoln, writes a campaign biography, very good book about Lincoln prior to the election of 1860. And it's a, it died um, at an early age, in, in age of 50, in 1870. But he was a very fine writer, mm-hmm. as, as well as an energetic editor. Does being an editor make you a better writer? Is there a nice synergy between those two? Yes, I, I, I think it might. I mean, it helps you. Um, see the your own errors I mean it, it helps you appreciate the um, again the, like the story in Oakland mm-hmm. <laughs> cutting it by 4,000 words I mean, it, it, it uh, helps you to trim out um, um, excess language I, my writing I think is getting better because it's getting simpler I, I'm getting more 
uh, careful about using adjectives. <laughs> <laughs> but it, yes, it, it does. And, and uh, as editor, you have written a column in, in your, your new book, uh, yeah. uh, Pretense uh, to Empire, which will be on sale outside, uh, was, uh, uh, is a collection of, of those uh, essays, essays yeah. that you've written during this, uh, this period. Uh, how, do you, how do you write? I'm, I'm curious about that. I know that in, in the recent issue of Harper's, you have a piece on uh, private armies and their role in history, looking at our present use of yeah. uh, the privatization of the military and then going back in history. How long did it take you to write that piece? Uh, well, I write slowly. I, I, I write, first of all, longhand. And um, then I dictate it to my secretary. And then she gives me back the, the <coughs> type copy. And I correct that. And I probably write six or seven drafts. I also keep a, jur I, I keep a journal on, of um, what I read, whether it's newspaper or whether, I, whether I'm reading a, whatever book I happen to be reading. I, I keep sort of a daily log. And um, I've been reading a number of books about uh, the private armies, most, most wonderfully one by a woman named Frances Stoner Saunders called The Devil's Broker, which is about a mercenary captain uh, with a private army in northern Italy in the 14th century named Sir John Hawkwood. Actually, the, the early private banded armies of the late 14th century are the early models of our modern corporation. I mean, they were, they were set up uh, in very similar ways, mm -hmm. <laughs> with a very similar objects in view. And the, uh, so I'd been reading her book. And, making occasional notes on what she mm -hmm. had been saying. And then as the Halliburton story became more prominent in, in the news, I made the, the connection. But it, it's like that. I mean, I, I, whatever, something comes out of the news and I usually have some um, odd historical or not so odd historical um, reference in mind. And, and in that essay and in the book, uh, it's very clear that history is very important uh, for you as you think about issues and want to place them in a broader context than, than the present. But also sarcasm, too, and irony and so on are, are powerful tools in your hand. Well, yeah, the uh, sarcasm and irony are helped by a sense of history because you can get a juxtaposition between uh, either a not so idealized past or a possibly idealized, idealized future. But the, the irony and the sarcasm work because it's a, uh, it's a dissonance. But you have to have at least two elements going for you before you can have the, the dissonance. And um, as I say, I started out wanting to be an historian. At, after Yale, went to Cambridge, and um, have always uh, learned from history. Cicero makes the well. I'm, Cicero's point is not to know what happened before one was born is always to be a child. Hmm. And and then there's Twain's wonderful line where he says, "History doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes." And, uh, <laughs> you, <laughs> so you can, I, I find it a, a way of uh, learning something. It, it's, um, it gives you a context. And um, I'm now going to start a new journal. I mean, I left Harper's Magazine in order to start something called Laughlin's Quarterly, which is going to, God willing, first issue would come out sometime next uh, spring or early summer where I will take an idea that's in the news, mm -hmm. perpetual states of war, or predicament of women, or dream of empire, or uh, a, you know, failure of, of uh, economy, and so on, and write a brief introductory essay, and then run out a series of texts, maybe 40, 50 of them, uh, on that theme, 
taken, you know, out of a historical record. So I'd be editing people like Seneca or Thucydides, mm. or, uh, but I also do fictions. I'd allow myself to do Shakespeare and, and then Balzac and, and um, Cervantes, as well mm -hmm. as Gibbon and Macaulay, and, and try to give uh, the reader a sense of the historical mm -hmm. context. We, we've been there before, mm -hmm. and uh, um, we can learn from the past. I mean, we have nothing else really with which to build the future except the lumber of the past. And uh, I find that a lot of people today lack that context. And if you don't have that context and if you're lost in the perpetual present of the television, because there's television is a form that um, there's really no past and no present. There's no cause and effect. It's, it's the eternal now. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a very frightening place to, uh, to live. And it, it, it instills in people a, a sense of credulous anxiety. And if you have a sense of your own history, uh, it gives you a place to, um, to stand. I have a quote from you. Uh, print allows for narrative and continuity, for a beginning, a middle, and an end, for cause and effect, straight lines, the novels of Jane Austen, etc. The electronic media dote on the emotions, on discontinuity, impressions, improvisations, and pattern recognition. You, you wrote that somewhere. I, I did. I was writing about, I was, I'm borrowing those ideas of McLuhan's. Mm -hmm. and the, uh, he makes that, you know, he says this in, in his book, Understanding Media, which was published in 1964. And when I read it in 1964, I didn't understand it because uh, he, he has a tendency toward an oracular style. Mm -hmm. But then in 1994, 30 years later, I was asked to write an introduction to a, a new edition of, of Understanding Media. And um, learned a great deal from it and he is distinguishing uh, between the different forms of, of sensibility uh, that come about in response to different forms of media. Uh, he begins with the premise that we shape our t we shape our tools and then our tools shape mm -hmm. us and the electronic revolution is, to his mind, equally as important as the revolution that takes place after the invention of movable type in, in the Gutenberg in the 14th century. So we learn to look at uh, uh, the world through a different lens, and the um, and it's true about the at least I think what he says about the electronic media is seems to me to be so I mean it, it is a circular it's about emotion it really the the content isn't as important as the surge of emotion that, that and it really doesn't matter what the emotion is about um, and we now and I think that's one of our uh, um, problems is, is how to make our a coherent political um, idea in in the new forms of, of media mm -hmm. and and this his insights and, and your uh, uh, comments on those insights s seem to me to be a, a path into understanding our political our present political situation because uh, uh, our uh, people in charge these days in Washington seem to be very attuned to manipulating these differences in print and, and, and the media and, and in, in, in essence, they're better at packaging their lives than anybody else. Yes, they're very good at it. I mean, the, the, uh, um, it, they, they approach politics 
the manner of the advertising business mm -hmm. and, and the uh, the time allowances are um, very short. I mean, I, I, I once did a six-part television documentary on the history of American foreign policy in the 20th century, and you would think that six hours was a lot of time, and it, but it's not. And mm -hmm. the and I can remember. Uh, being confronted with a problem of I had something like 73 words and 43 seconds or 43 words and 73 seconds I can't remember which in which to explain or account for the outbreak of World War II <laughs> and the not only did I have to fit it to the to the to that time and those words but I I also had to connect still photographs of the Munich conference mm -hmm. in September 1938 with the bombing of Warsaw in September 1939. And that's the kind of medium that it is. Mm -hmm. and the, uh, I don't think we've yet, it's, it's, we, we have this wonderful toy, um, but I'm not sure that we've yet developed a, a um, a language uh, that can use it uh, as an art. The, McLuhan makes that point too. The movable type comes along um, in, in the um, end of the 15th century, I think. But it's another hundred years before you get to um, Cervantes and Shakespeare and um, Montaigne. Mm -hmm. So it takes time before you we, we can learn how to use these forms. And that's one of the confusions that uh, we see happening today. You know, what is the media and, and newspapers and internet? And uh, it, it's almost the, the more we know, the less we know. And um, how do we know what we know? I mean, it, it's an, these are epistemological problems. Your book is a collection of essays which you wrote over a period from 202, say, to, to the present. And, and w at the time that you were writing uh, these essays, what, it, what you were saying wasn't as apparent to a broader audience. And now uh, everything is hitting the fan. The, the Bush order is, is unraveling day by day and yeah. so on. So uh, I think our audience should go and read your book, but what I, what I want to pull out of you is your insights, because there are many about the structural things that are at work. And one of them is, is what we just talked about, the way the media yeah, has yeah. changed, and he who controls the media, uh, this new kind of, of, of narrative, uh, is the one who can uh, yeah. have political power. Uh, another insight uh, that, that you, you draw on, you, you talk about uh, a seminar you go to to hear uh, a discussion of Veblen's, uh, uh, Thorsten Veblen's writings. Right. And, and you go and you go back and do some reading, the good historian that you are, and, and you, you were taken by his insights. I believe he was writing about land developers and the right. need to sell the land and fool the people and there would be a pot of gold in the Emerald City and so on. Yeah. And so, so this is another theme in America that, that brings us to the present in a way, basically. The, the nature of our capitalism and the forms it's taken. Yeah, I mean, Ve Veblen um, is a extraordinarily, I think, uh, um, sharp-eyed and, and uh, witty observer of the American uh, scene. He is, of course, the man who invents the term conspicuous consumption and um, the theory of the leisure class and the spending of money um, for, uh, in order to prove one's uh, a state of grace, really. I mean, not, not for a utilitarian purpose, mm -hmm. but for a display purpose. And in that essay, what I think I was talking about was Veblen trying to ex talking about the the uh, economy of a of a small uh, town in, in in the Middle West in in, in the 1890s. But he but I, I used his essay 
to, to try to show that there would, really wasn't that much of a difference between the red state and the blue state. I mean, the, the red state, blue state um, division that the Republicans make so much of is really an advertiser's demographic. It, it doesn't accurately reflect um, the way people think in, in different parts of the country. In, in other words, in order to, to assign somebody a, an attitude simply because of their address is, you know, that's the way you would try to sell them a watch. <laughs> but it, it's really not the way you would try to find out what was in their mind, and I was using the essay that way. Uh, as the editor of Harper's, for, for three decades, yeah. you had a seat to really see the, the changing currents in the in the literary scene uh, and 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 in our culture. What 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 was being an editor in the seventies different from being an editor in the eighties and the nineties and you know into the present? How did uh, the the writing change. How did the the selection of uh, pieces that you could run change? What were the the different constraints, if any? Did America change in that period, and did you see it from your position at Harper's? Yes, I mean when I I become editor, I become I become managing editor in 1971, and I became the editor in 1975. And during the period of this, in the 70s. Uh, I think that we were still, I was still trying to think of the magazine uh, as the marketplace of ideas, right? And mm -hmm. I was trying to think of it in terms of debate. I would publish pieces written by uh, individuals who were on the left and individuals who were also on the right. And, and during that period of the 70s, some of the leading um, arguments, political arguments, were on the, on the side of the right. I mean, the early writings of people like William Crystal and Norman Podhoretz, who uh, subsequently um, congealed into, into <laughs> hard-shell neoconservatives. But in, in, the, in the 70s, uh, they were um, a lot of people of that kind of persuasion were making uh, good uh, points about some of the weaknesses in the uh, American liberal um, imperium. Late 30s, 40s, 50s, you, you could say that the American, uh, the, the, almost the entire American intellectual uh, landscape was liberal, whether you were talking about the democratic control of the Congress or the attitude in, the, in place in the school system and the foundations and the, in most of the publications and the, the conservative side of the argument or what has become the conservative side of the argument was really um, irritable, twitching, I think. Mm -hmm. That's not my phrase. I think that's Galbraith, but somebody was making that <laughs> point. But in the 70s, I, it was possible you could um, come into arguments and uh, have a real engagement with people on different sides of the question. And people could, could uh, go so far as to say that they were wrong or that they could learn something. And um, there, was a there, there was a conversation. After the Reagan um, election in the 80s, and it increasingly became what had been a, a more fluid um, exchange of ideas, be hardened, I think, into um, more polemical positions. You're either with us or against us. And if you're with us, you're going to be writing for um, either the nation on the one hand or, or national review on the other. And, and um, there, there was a tendency for people to um, stop talking to each other and, and to be um, using words uh, rather, instead of as means of expression as uh, 
blunt instruments with which to, <laughs> you know, belabor their their enemies. And the um, and and then there's also the loss of vocabulary, mm -hmm. which is is something else that McLuhan points out. 1941, the average vocabulary of the of a high school student was that high school senior was something like um, 9,000 or 10,000 words. And then four or five years ago, when I last saw the statistic, it was down to 5,000 words. So that, that's a result of, of television, of, of the broadcast discourse. You, you, again, when you find that you're writing for television, you can't use, it's hard to use long words. It very, you can't really back into uh, sentences with um, participial clauses, it, it has to start, um, you know, subject, verb, object, uh, you know, it's a kind of Dick and Jane language that, that, mm -hmm. and, and, the, and that has a, had an effect. Uh, the, um, you begin to lose the devices of irony and, and um, we now have, I think that it's a very big number that the Department of Health Education places on the illiteracy of the, of the American public. I, I don't know the number, but it's, it's something like 20 or 30 million, or maybe even 40. I have the, the quote from Orwell's Politics in the English Language, but what ought to recognize that the present political chaos is connected with the decay of language, and that one can probably bring about some improvement by starting at the verbal end. Do you think we're not teaching our, our, our students to write anymore, and, and, and that is part of the solution to this problem of, of restoring the democratic ethos? Because you, I, I, I sense that you believe strongly that we can't have uh, citizens who are active and engaged and thinking unless they can write and talk and, 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 and have the skills that we used to learn. Well, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, yes, I certainly think that. Right, yeah. And it's not only the skill and the, uh, the habit of reading and, and, and of writing, but it's also the um, time to allow that kind of a conversation to take place. The kind of conversation that you and I are now having uh, is almost impossible. I can't imagine where on television uh, uh, this could happen because to stop and pause and uh, seem to think is, <laughs> is, is, a, uh, is a crime. On, I, mean, on, 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 I mean, from a from television camera's point of view. Yeah. And so it isn't only that uh, people don't learn to write because they don't acquire the habit of, of reading. Um, and it takes time to teach people how to write. It, it's, um, you have to learn grammar and syntax and, you know, begin. And, but you must read because there's, there's no other way to learn it. So, so I guess the question is, are we at a tipping point so that the impeachment, the, you, you wrote an essay uh, uh, on some work that uh, uh, Representative Conyers was doing in the House. Uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, in essence, I believe he was saying, well, I'm doing this even though it may not have an effect now, but I will have taken you know, a stance. So the, the question is, as all of this is now coming out to a broader audience, the failure in Iraq, uh, the, the, the failure in response to Katrina, and so on, do, are we at a tipping point so that impeachment could conceivably become a political reality that uh, the Democrats come in, in in both houses of Congress and begin investigations. Do you think we could realistically hope for an impeachment of George Bush? No, but I think I, I, I do again think like Conyers. The, the the piece in the in the book that you're referring to is, is called a case for impeachment, and it follows from um, the. Uh, bill introduced into Congress by John Conyers of Michigan last December suggesting that there be first censure and then investigation as to whether there were grounds for impeachment now. Uh, 
I think that we owe it to ourselves to impeach Bush. Yeah. Um, the, whether the Congress will do that or not is, uh, I, I would expect not. And I think that would be, a, a, to me, that is a uh, failure on the, on the part of the Congress because what we're talking about, at least what I'm trying to talk about, is, and what Conyers was trying to talk about, is not uh, the failure of a particular policy vis-a-vis -vis Iraq or tax cuts for the wealthy or the homeland security and Katrina and minimum wage and so on. It's, it's, it's the Bush administration's attack on the constitutional order on which this country is based. I mean, it is the abuse of power. And it is, it is, a, it is a usurping of power on the part of the executive. And there are many proofs of that. I mean, the, the denial of habeas corpus to, this was as recently as last week, mm -hmm. uh, to persons suspected or detained on, on a suspicion of terrorism, the, the um, taking of the interpretation of the president's action uh, out of the jurisdiction of the courts, the granting uh, to the president uh, the authority to declare, to decide who and who is not an enemy combatant whether a foreign national or an American citizen. The, uh, the flat statement um, on the part of, of Bush with regard to uh, the warrantless tapping of, of telephones and the interception of email messages, and he says, in fact, I will do as I please. Mm -hmm. And the muzzling of um, the Congress, the, the Republican majority acting in, in sort of as a stormtrooper for the, for the executive, for the administration, the refusal on the part of the government to give to the Congress information that it, the, it, it, it constitutionally deserves to have, the conduct of, of government behind closed doors, the the uh, in, the increased um, seizure of power to uh, interfere with the lives of, of of the citizens and so on. There's a whole long list, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the the refusal to recognize international treaties. Um, the impeachment is is um, process. It's not to punish Bush. Bush any competent criminal court in the country could mm -hmm. send Bush mm -hmm. to jail mm -hmm. for, you know, fraud. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not the uh, responsibility of the Congress to censure Bush morally. Mm -hmm. The Yale Divinity School can do that. And, and, <laughs> and the, uh, Take back his degree. <laughs> or Jerry Falwell can do that. But the it is the responsibility of the, of the Congress to maintain the balance of power on which the country is based and not to completely abdicate it, it's the, the, the power of the legislature. So and it is for this reason, that, and, and so you have, and, and, and the founders recognize this, they recognize that when the abuse of, of power could become so excessive on the part of the of the executive that it would be it's harmful to the mechanics of of decent government and so to remove bush is like removing a tumor it, it's 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 um it, it it's a malign growth on 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 the body politic and that is the way the impeachment should be understood uh, I'm afraid the Congress won't understand it that way, but, uh, but I do think uh, if we 
as a country or as a political body continued to believe in, in uh, democracy in the way that we say that we believe in it, we would impeach him. But again, I think that what has been happening over the last 20 odd years is a loss of faith in the possibility of the democratic idea. And that's not only happening in the United States, that's happening in, 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 in Europe. It's happening in England. Many of the same kinds of things that the Bush administration is doing in the US, the Blair government is doing in England. Mm -hmm. And funnily enough, you get more belief in, in the idea of, of democracy in the East mm -hmm. than you do in the West. <laughs> and that strikes me as a profound irony. Yes, so I do think, to go back to your question, yes, it is a tipping point. So uh, we, we want to leave our audience, uh, especially the young people, with some element of hope here. Yeah. And I guess what, what I want to ask you is, looking at our history, you know, our, our traditions, when they haven't been corrupted, what, what kind of political movement do you see emerging that might turn these things around? It, it's not clear to me at all that it will be in the Democratic Party. It conceivable, it could be in something like the environmental movement, which is posing a threat that is a, a real threat to you know, the world as we know it, based on what we as, as humanity are, are doing uh, to the environment. What are the possibilities here that, that you, know, you have thought about or you're hoping for or what? Well, I think there are a lot of possibilities. I was um, uh, at coffee this afternoon with a friend of mine named Arthur Blaustein, who is a teacher here at, uh, at Berkeley, and um, has organized um, a number of um, volunteer organizations. Um, America Corps, I believe, is one of them, and I think you have the largest contingent of those kinds of volunteers anywhere in the country. Mm -hmm. um, several hundred undergraduates who are approaching the notion of the common good uh, as participants. Um, and whether it, it takes the form of teaching um, in um, the poorer school districts or uh, working on environmental issues, um, it's, that is the democratic idea. It's, it's still alive and well, I mean, in, in, in the country as a whole. I mean, you have a ballot, uh, in, I think, in Berkeley and in San Francisco to impeach Bush, uh, but as a local initiative. And the trouble is that uh, the notion, of the, the idea of democracy, if, if you go back to Montesquieu and in in the spirit of the law, the, it, he distinguishes between the animating principle between democracy, monarchy, uh, aristocracy, despotism. He, he runs through a number of forms of government. And the one that's implicit in democracy in his mind is virtue. It's a, it's a willingness to take care of, look out for, uh, one another. And this is, of course, the way it gets, makes a connection to uh, the New Testament. The Bush administration is a great, uh, uh, the Old Testament is, is, is their, uh, <laughs> is their text, you know, the miserable, bloody, bloody-minded <laughs> God, right? <laughs> uh, but the, um, um, Ralph Nader made the point uh, very forcefully in the election of, of, of 2000 when he said, if, if a, a million people in this country would give, you know, over the course of a year, $100 and 100 hours mm -hmm. to, I believe what he calls civil or civic um, service, we, we could make great changes in the country. And um, we, we don't see enough of, of that in our media. And we, we don't see enough programs like this one 
or like the other ones that you do with, with, with people who think out loud. And the, if, if, if I could raise enough money, I'd try to have a, um, a television channel like C-SPAN uh, that would just do events like this because there are, there are um, or, or put the camera in a laboratory or put it in a, in a dance troupe in New Mexico or in a theater in uh, Minnesota or, you know. Uh, there are a lot of, of um, very uh, creative and uh, um, engaged people in, in the United States. But the, the major news media <coughs> blocks them out. I mean, and so what you get instead is Paris Hilton. Mm -hmm. And somehow we, we, we you know, it, it's, um, we, we got to do more of the, the kind of thing that you do and the more of the kind of thing that the uh, kids here at Berkeley are doing. Mm -hmm. And um, well, to me, there's a lot of hope in that because the William Sloan Coffin, who was the, uh, um, chaplain at Yale University in the 60s, if you remember, he was very active in both the civil rights movement and in the anti-war movement. And his notion of democracy was that it was the great escape from uh, the prison of the self. In other words, uh, the public interest is more interesting than than I am, <laughs> you know. I mean, it gives you a chance to take part in a uh, bigger, more interesting self, mm -hmm. and that's the uh, that was his way of uh, of um, explaining the the idea. So, so in a way, that in this conversation, we've got gone back to where we began. Because it was that uh, that uh, sense of the public sphere that you learned as a young person. I, I think I remember you saying, and that uh, really affected the the choices uh, that you made, uh, both in your career and, and the, the way you see the world. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, I, w I was very lucky in my uh, uh, childhood in, in San Francisco to see the. Um, and what Churchill, you know, to see the formation of the UN, mm -hmm. which is, is, is based on these kinds of ideas, it's a, an imperfect uh, organization, but um, Churchill said of the UN, you, you, it is not about arranging uh, the ascent to heaven, it is about preventing the descent to hell. <laughs> uh, and on that note, we have a, a, a time frame that, that is just about ending, and uh, I want to recommend your book to everybody, and I want to leave uh, everybody with a quote from that book, which is, in order to provoke political change, you need language that induces a change of heart. And thank you very much for doing that. Thank you. Thank you.